My life depicted a drama like a movie. Ten years ago, my marriage came to an abrupt end. I did not succumb to the whims of fate, found new love, and built a happy family. One day at a shopping mall, I encountered the hateful shadow of my past, my ex-husband, Theo. He spotted me and gave a sarcastic smile. <laughs> Still single, huh? Theo looked down on me, saying that. But when my current husband Jason appeared, his expression froze instantly. What happened between them? Let's uncover that mystery along with my story of revenge. My career as a dental hygienist started after high school. Communication with patients became smooth, and I established a solid position in my field. One day, a man came in as an emergency patient. That man said his tooth hurt. Unbearably, that was how Theo quietly stepped into my life. Through repeated treatments, we grew close and eventually fell in love. Theo, though busy as an office worker, always stopped by the clinic to enjoy conversations with me. One evening, he waited for me to get off work. How about dinner together? That one phrase became the key that connected our destinies. Drawn by Theo's brightness and friendliness, I soon accepted his proposal. I got married at 25, and we started our newlywed life in a new apartment. Theo was an ordinary office worker, but he was strongly determined to make me happy. However, married life was not so easy. Theo's household skills were poor; cooking and laundry didn't go well, and I ended up taking over everything. What initially seemed lovable as his clumsiness, eventually, for efficiency, I felt it was better to do things myself. I continued working as a dental hygienist, but Theo sought a better workplace and looked for a new job. His performance at the new job didn't improve, and he struggled with relationships too. At home, he complained more about work, saying that his boss doesn't value of his ideas. And that there must be a workplace that understands his worth. He began looking for a new job again. Thus, Theo repeatedly changed jobs, and my anxiety only grew. Seven years after our marriage, feeling unrecognized, Theo finally gave up working outside and started operating stock investments from home. Worried, I asked him, "Are you sure you can do stock investing? Do you know how to do it?" He answered optimistically, "I don't know yet, but looking online, it says even beginners can gain knowledge, and you won't gain knowledge without trying, right? Everything is a challenge." I was worried, but I've heard a lot about failures in stock trading. Shouldn't you stop before you lose money? However, he was full of confidence. <laughs> don't worry. I'm not stupid. I'll stop before losing money. But if I get the hang of it, I might be able to earn easily. Theo had a tendency to be optimistic about things. That's why he kept changing jobs. However, Theo used the savings we had accumulated together for stock investments, and he did it without telling me. Hey, why did you use our savings without asking? I asked angrily. To that, he laughed and said, <laughs> "Because if I asked, you'd definitely say no, right? Well, think of it as a little investment in me. I'll make things easier for us from now on." <sighs> We didn't save money to use it for something like this, but the investments unexpectedly brought profits, and Theo got even more carried away. Honestly, if there had been a loss at that time. Theo would have quit investing. Using this success, Theo began to take stock investing seriously. He bought several computers for investing, lined them up in his room, and started staring at stock price screens every day. But although Theo said he would study stock investing, he didn't show any sign of reading specialized magazines or anything. He probably misunderstood a little profit as having grasped the knack. Investing without studying led to many failures, and most were losses. I still had hopes for Theo, because I believed that 
if he had the willingness to challenge, he could find a job he was interested in and return to our previous life. To continue living with Theo, I worked hard. However, Theo betrayed my expectations and sought an easier life. When I came home from work, I saw him lazing around the house, and I spent my days catching up on accumulated housework he never did. When there was even a little profit, Theo would go out at night like a college student. Worried, I asked him, Aren't you going out drinking too much lately? Is the investment going well? If not, shouldn't you work normally? He laughed and answered, If you can earn easily, isn't that the best? I sighed and said, That may be true, but I'm saying this for your sake. Investments don't always go well, right? Wouldn't it be better to work and do that as a hobby? But Theo revealed his anger. Stop lecturing me. I quietly argued back. Our current life is sustainable because I work. I want you to go back to your old self. Don't wander around at night, work normally, and let's lead a happy life. Theo said unhappily, I am doing what I can. What's wrong with taking a break occasionally? He said that and left the house. One day, I found lipstick on Theo's shirt, and it wasn't mine. Moreover, the misuse of money became severe, and looking at the family card statement, I found out he was buying luxury brand items. He wasn't wearing them, and they weren't presents for me. Were they for another woman? And those payments were made with the money I earned. For 10 years, I had continued my marriage with Theo diligently, but is this my reward? I decided to have a talk with Theo. After finishing work and returning home, I stopped him as he was about to go out. We need to talk. What is it all of a sudden? I'm about to head out. It's important, so listen. Hurry up. You're cheating, aren't you? I found lipstick on your shirt, and I know you've been buying things from luxury brands recently. <sighs> Why are you so nitpicky? You're really annoying. So what do you want? Holding back my tears, I said, Don't be evasive. Do you know how much I've supported you? When did you ever support me? I don't remember being supported by you. Rather, you were always nagging me to work. I said with sadness, It was for you. We might have a child, and if that happens, I might not be able to work. Then Theo coldly said, A child? How old do you think you are? Thirty-five. Thirty-five and a child? Do you know that's a high-risk age? I desperately claimed. That's not true. But Theo laughed and said, You see it on the news, right? The dangers of late childbirth. I don't want to take such a risk. If I'm going to have a child, it should be with a younger woman, not you. What? I couldn't hide my shock. Actually, my investments have been doing well lately. I haven't told you, but my current girlfriend has been supporting me. So, I'm divorcing you. Divorce? Are you serious? I asked in disbelief. I'm serious. The one supporting me now is not you, but another woman. Uh, that's just... I felt despair. She's obedient to me, so the divorce is decided. We should discuss this. It's over. I don't want to see your face. I'll send the divorce papers later. Theo said this and packed his things and left the house. I just wanted a sincere conversation. I couldn't accept Theo's sudden departure and was in denial for a while. I believed he would come to his senses and change his mind, so I called him many times, but he didn't answer. A few days later, the unavoidable reality came in the form of a letter. The Divorce Papers Reflecting on the past ten years of my life, I meditated. The happiness I felt in my first marriage now seems like a distant dream. 
the dream of having children and building an ordinary but happy family faded away with tears. But when my tears dried, I resolved to take a new step to change the situation. Fortunately, I have a job. I made up my mind and signed the divorce papers. And ten years passed. One day, I unexpectedly reunited with my ex-husband, Theo, whom I thought I would never see again. While shopping at the mall, I felt someone's gaze. Then, a man approached with a sneer. It was Theo. Beside him was a young woman and a child. Is that his new family? Well, well. I never thought it would be you. Long time no see. Theo's voice had a mix of surprise and some smugness. Yeah, you look well. I pretended to be calm. Theo looked more worn than before, and his clothes seemed outdated. Is that your wife and child? I asked. Oh yeah, I got remarried and have a child now. This is my daughter Kate. Isn't she cute? Theo introduced his daughter, and the little girl looked at me shyly. Yes, children are always cute. I emphasized the word children intentionally. What about you? Still single? A woman who can only have a late child wouldn't have a partner, right? Theo's words were as insulting as ever. I am remarried too. I replied calmly. That's a lie. Considering our relationship, there's no need to put on such airs. You're living alone, aren't you? Theo looked down on me more than ever. No. Actually, I've been busy raising a child recently. Because of that, I even quit my job at the clinic. I answered calmly. What? You mean you neither have a family nor a job? Is that why you're sad and came shopping? How pathetic. Theo chuckled. I stared at him and said, "Are you even listening? I am remarried and have a child too." A late child? Well, I can't believe it. If it's true, isn't there something wrong? Where is the child? When Theo looked around, he saw a child in a wheelchair. <laughs> that one? Poor thing," he said. At that moment, a man's voice said, "Are you okay?" From behind me, it was Jason, my current husband, approaching with our daughter. Oh yeah, I just ran into my ex-husband. I've told you about him, right? I said to Jason. Theo looked astonished. Really, you remarried? He muttered. When Jason looked at Theo, his expression changed instantly. What? Jason? Theo was surprised. Aren't you Theo? Was it? Jason was also surprised. Uh, yes. Theo answered in a small voice. It seems they knew each other. So I asked Jason, "How do you know each other?" Oh, he has been working part time at our site for a few years. Jason answered, "Part time." I was surprised, but Theo was even more shocked to find out I was the president's wife. In the ten years since I separated from Theo, I experienced a lot. To make a fresh start, I immediately changed my workplace. I renewed everything and began a new life. Fortunately, the demand for dental hygienists was high, and I quickly found a new job. That's where I met Jason. He was the president of a construction company and the owner of the building where my dental clinic was located. Dental checkup and building maintenance wove the threads of fate. Our meeting was not a coincidence, but perhaps destiny. Eventually, those threads turned into a bond of love, and we blossomed into marriage. In the spring of my thirty-eighth year, I conceived a new life. The following year, I cherished the joy of becoming a mother. An angel-like girl named Lily came into our home. She's now a six-year-old little miracle. Mom, look! Isn't that Lily? My ex-husband's daughter's voice stirred the air. Lily from TV? The girl's mother asked. Yes. She's in my favorite drama series. Theo, still doubtful, said, 
Isn't she just a look-alike? So I gently informed him. Oh, I haven't introduced her yet, have I? This is our daughter, Lily. She's actually a child actress. A child actress? Really? Theo couldn't hide his surprise. Yes, she's been appearing in dramas recently. His daughter's eyes sparkled like stars. Oh, it's really Lily! She exclaimed with delight. A child actress? How could a child like yours? Theo questioned. How? She wanted to do it, so we let her. But wasn't it a late birth? Theo still held his prejudice. You're too fixated on that. Just because it was a late birth doesn't necessarily mean complications. I harshly pointed out his ignorance. Then Jason addressed Theo. Theo, could we have a moment? Since the children are here, can we talk elsewhere? Uh, yes. Theo replied quietly, and we moved to Jason's office. The children played in the next room, and we started our discussion. You know that my company expanded its business and increased staff five years ago, right? Jason began. Yeah. At that time, Theo was hired mid-career. Jason revealed. As a part-time worker? Yes. I heard he had another main job, so we had him work as a day laborer. Isn't that right? Jason confirmed with Theo, who answered awkwardly. Um, yes, that's right. Are you still doing stock investments? I asked him. Yes, I am. Sometimes I make a big profit. Theo answered. But there are also losses, right? Is that why you're working part-time? That's none of your business. You're right. It's no longer my concern. I'm just worried about your wife and child. I showed my genuine concern. How cheeky. But she has been supporting me all along, unlike you. So she was your affair partner? Yes, that's right. That's why we have a happy family now. Theo said confidently, but looking at his wife, she seemed tired. She was ten years younger than me, but she seemed to be wearing heavy makeup to hide her age. Her clothes also looked a bit outdated, like Theo's. At the beginning of their marriage, she must have thought he was successful in stock trading. For the young her, it might have seemed like a dream. Unfortunately, she chose a terrible man as her husband. That's the price for taking someone else's husband. So why did you choose this woman? Theo asked Jason. Oh, what do you mean by that? Jason remained calm. She was 35 when we got divorced. Remarrying and having children after that means late childbirth. What would you do if a child with disabilities was born? Well, it looks like you were lucky this time, but... Theo persisted with his rigid beliefs. A child is a child. Whether they have disabilities or not, it's the parent's job to love and raise them. Jason answered quietly, and Theo dejected, left with his wife and daughter from the other room. After a while, it seemed like a major shock hit Theo. Jason does not bring personal issues into work. Although he declared that employment would be guaranteed, it is said that Theo self-destructed. Theo was jealous that I had become the president's wife, tried to succeed himself, and invested more in stocks, resulting in a huge loss. To recover from that loss, he got involved in illegal sports gambling and ended up losing all his assets. The amount was $1 million. In the process, he also borrowed money from problematic places. As a result, he stopped showing up at the company and was reportedly running from debt collectors. The company found out because one of them contacted the company about his whereabouts. Even his wife, who had followed him, abandoned him, and I heard they finally divorced. He's now probably being asked to pay alimony and child support. And despite having built a happy family, his actions led to its collapse. It is truly pathetic. As for our family, my husband's work is going well, and we are living happily. Our daughter Lily is becoming more popular as a child actress, appearing in dramas and commercials every day. Thanks to that, I am extremely busy as her manager. While accompanying her to filming locations, my career as a dental hygienist has also gained attention. 
At first, it was supervisory work advising on the depiction of dental clinics and dramas, but eventually I started taking care of the actor's dental maintenance. One time, I had the opportunity to look at the teeth of a male actor who is a big fan of mine, and I was lucky enough to admire his face close up. We had a lot on our plate, but seeing Lily enthusiastically working doubles my joy as a parent. Will my husband's company soar globally? And will Lily advance on the path to becoming a great actress? Every day is filled with such dreams. My cheating husband said, I'm going to my parents' home for a while to take care of my sick mom. But she was right in front of me. My husband John purposely created tension between my mother and me so we wouldn't communicate. The reason was for him to have more freedom to cheat. To keep up his lies, he kept adding more lies. It was all his selfish thinking. But lies eventually get exposed. His supposedly perfect alibi crumbled. Once my mother-in-law and I discovered the truth, we teamed up. What would be the fate of my lying husband? John had been making a fuss about his mom being sick, but after being deceived on purpose, the truth came out. What's your relationship with your mother-in-law like after marriage? Good? Terrible? The dynamic between a wife and mother-in-law can change based on compatibility and differing views, but the key factor is the husband's role. I believe this is crucial. Especially early in the marriage, the husband is the main source of information about his parents and the only way to interact with the mother-in-law. I didn't have the courage to approach them alone. So I relied on my husband for my relationship with his family. Of course, it's not like I didn't do anything myself. Whenever I had the chance, I'd suggest to my husband, Why don't we invite your parents for dinner? It's Mother's Day next Sunday. Or when we went on trips, I'd say, Let's bring this souvenir to your parents. I really tried to build a good relationship. But John was always against it from the start. Mom and Dad don't like eating out, so inviting them might be a bother. Or, mom and dad hate unexpected visitors. I'll give them the gift on my way back from work. It felt like he was avoiding any interaction between me and his parents. Honestly though, I was somewhat relieved since I was also nervous around my mother-in-law Lauren. But even after my efforts, my husband never agreed to let me interact with his parents. A year into our marriage, the only times I met my in-laws were during the wedding introduction, the wedding itself, and a brief visit on our first Christmas as a married couple. We didn't live far away, but my husband, whose workplace was near his parents' house, never took me along. I started to feel awkward and asked him, Shouldn't I be visiting your parents since I'm your wife? But he brushed off my concerns. I started to worry and decided to ask him directly. That's when I discovered the worst truth. Hey, are you avoiding taking me to your parents' house? Do your parents hate me or something? No, it's not that. But I can't hide it anymore. I'm sorry, Irene. What? What are you sorry for? Mom finds you a bit difficult to deal with and prefers to keep her distance from you. I knew something was off. Did I do something wrong to your mom? I'm sorry, Irene. I didn't want to hurt you. It's not your fault. It's just that mom has an aversion to you. An aversion? So she hates me? Why? What did I do? Everyone has people they just don't click with, you know? For mom, that's you. You don't have to force yourself to get along. I'll handle visiting them. It was a big shock to hear that. After that, I couldn't bring myself to approach my in-laws anymore. Instead, my husband kept visiting them frequently. As an only child, his mom asked him to visit at least once a week. Recently, my in-laws have been calling him more often for errands. I get called to do shopping or change light bulbs. Taking care of them is a lot of work. He'd tell me, while diligently going to their place. Watching him, I thought, 
So she doesn't want to see me at all, but wants her son to visit her that often. Is she trying to get him back from me or something? It made me increasingly resentful towards her. I stopped visiting completely and avoided contacting her. If she hates me, I'll reciprocate. That was my defensive mindset, and I resigned myself to it. But it turned out this was all part of my husband's plan. One day after work, I ran into my mother-in-law at the supermarket. I honestly wanted to hide. She looked equally surprised and awkward. But I felt obligated to greet her out of basic manners. Uh, hi, Lauren. Long time no see. Do you often come to the supermarket? Irene, what a surprise. I came here because our usual store is closed today. But what's going on with your outfit? She responded more warmly than I expected, which threw me off. Then she started scrutinizing my clothes. I braced myself for a comment thinking, what is she going to tell me now? But I was wearing my work uniform, not something revealing or flashy, so I thought she couldn't criticize my outfit. What does she not like about my outfit then? I started, oh, this? It's my work uniform. I took on my jacket because it's warm today. She looked surprised and said, I thought you quit your job to be a housewife. Isn't that what you said? I was speechless. Something fell off. Lauren continued, My son told me you quit your job to be a housewife, but didn't do any housework and outsourced everything. That's why we've been giving him money to help with the bills. I was stunned. Who was she talking about? She continued, I was shocked to see you here since I thought you never cooked. And what's with the uniform? Did you get a new job? Sorry if I'm being intrusive. I know you don't really like me. I didn't mean to pry. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Was this really my mother-in-law? But it was definitely her. She tried to leave, but I stopped her to clear things up. Lauren, there seems to be a misunderstanding. I've always wanted to get to know you better. I never disliked you. Would you like to talk over a coffee? I was nervous. If she really did dislike me, my invitation would make our relationship worse. But she said, Really? I've wanted to talk to you too. I'd love to get to know my daughter-in-law better. Relieved, I invited her to my house and we talked over coffee. John said he would be home a little late today, and she also told her husband that she would be returning home a bit late. So we were able to sit down at home, have some coffee, and talk about various things. That's when the shocking truth came out. My husband had told his mom that I didn't want to get close to her and her relatives, that I saw them as outsiders. He even told her to avoid contacting me. And all this from right after we got married. I have never said such a thing. And to me, he'd say, I'm visiting my parents today. We'll have dinner together. Or, Mom asked me to come over today because she needs help moving some big furniture. He'd stop by his parents' place once. No, twice a week. According to Lauren, though, he visited them only once a month asking for money with excuses like, Sorry, we're short on cash because Irene spends too much money on Uber Eats. It was clear my husband had been manipulating our relationship. The real enemy was my husband. This is too much. But why would my husband lie like this? I talked with Lauren and understood that he had been lying to both of us to keep us from becoming close and communicating directly. When I realized this, I felt relieved. I really was shocked and hurt to be told she disliked me. She felt the same way, saying, I wish I had the courage to talk to you sooner. She was so kind. I never knew how sweet she was. I regretted not making the first move. 
We talked a lot afterward, getting to know each other better and becoming friends. Our next topic was, why did John lie? The most obvious reason was cheating. He left home claiming to visit his parents, but he was seeing his mistress and asking for money from his mom. When I suspected he was cheating, I felt I couldn't forgive him and wanted a divorce. But I hesitated because it would end the new relationship with my mother-in-law. She said, If he's cheating, we must find out. Even if he's my son, I can't forgive betrayal. Let's catch him. You can dump him afterwards. Her support encouraged me. She's such a good mother-in-law. Why is her son such a jerk? Raising kids is tough, and humans are a mystery. Even though she said that, I was still hesitant. Is it really a good idea to expose his infidelity? I was worried she'd get hurt again. But contrary to my indecisiveness, a miracle happened. Just then, John called. Hey, it's bad. Mom's sick. She's being hospitalized now. That's what he said. His mother was right in front of me, and I was confused. Wait, your mom is sick? Um, I stammered. It's okay, it's not life-threatening. Don't worry. But she'll be in the hospital, so I'll be with her for three days. I won't be home, but don't worry. And don't call her. Your call might stress her out, so no calls, okay? I'll be at the hospital, so no phone for the next few days. He said, and quickly hung up. So, is this a cheating trip? He's just like a moth flying into the flame. What a stupid husband. Doesn't he know he's caught? Hearing his blatant lie, I was enraged. He lied without any hesitation or guilt. This guy thinks I'm stupid. I realized he planned to lie forever, and my anger only grew. So I told Lauren everything. She said, Perfect. If he's cheating, we'll catch him red-handed. Leave it to me. Let me do this as your mother-in-law. And she immediately called a detective. So we left it to the professionals to catch him in the act. Meanwhile, my mother-in-law and I prepare for divorce moving out and claiming alimony, basically cutting ties with my husband. We were busy with these plans. Three days later, my husband came home looking happy, but he was shocked to see both of us. Why is mom here? And why are you together? He looked more and more pale. Welcome back, honey. Did you enjoy your trip? Any souvenirs? I didn't go on a trip. I, I was, uh... You said I was hospitalized, but I'm perfectly healthy. Why did you lie? Well, there was a work problem, but I was embarrassed to say it. So you lied? Yes, work was tough. I called your office. They said you took leave to care for someone. Who were you caring for? At Disneyland? Not me, not your mom, not your dad, so who? Wait, you called my office? Uh, no, it was a business trip. Enough already! We have proof! Proof of your affair! I enjoyed watching him squirm, but my mother-in-law sternly confronted him. She pulled out evidence photos. Seeing them, he surrendered. Sorry, I was wrong. He admitted, apologizing to both of us. But it didn't end there. Now, it was interrogation time. We asked about how long the affair had been going on, his future plans with his mistress, and why he lied to us. Whether it was due to our intensity or the undeniable evidence right in front of him, he confessed all his sins straightforwardly. First, he had been cheating since shortly before our wedding. His affair was with one of the venue staff from our wedding. They started dating during the wedding planning. I thought, why not break up with me then? 
But his mistress was married too, so they kept it casual. Why cheat when you're married? He lied about going to his parents' house, but was actually meeting his mistress. It was a well thought out deception. Claiming to be a dutiful son made me not question him. If I had a bad relationship with his mom, I wouldn't ask her about his whereabouts. He tricked us both from the start. I felt so betrayed and stupid. After his confession, I handed him the signed divorce papers. He apologized, saying it was just for the thrill and he'd never do it again. He promised to break up with her. But I couldn't forgive him. He lied to me constantly. I couldn't trust him anymore. He resisted the divorce, but my mother in law grabbed him by the neck, and my father in law, who arrived after being contacted, took him away. This allowed me to prepare to move out without him finding out my new address. Their help was invaluable. After moving, I demanded a divorce through my lawyer. My husband, having been scolded by his parents, quickly agreed. I also demanded alimony from both him and his mistress. She lost her job for having an affair with a customer and got divorced too. Apparently, she demanded my husband support her. But I don't care anymore. My divorce was finalized and he paid alimony, then got kicked out by his parents. He was shunned at work for using Lee for an affair trip. Cheaters get what they deserve. I was pleased he faced the consequences. My mother in law's support was crucial. She didn't side with her son but held him accountable. She was really a great mother in law. If I could go back, I'd want to befriend her from the start. But, well, my cheating husband would have ruined our relationship anyway. I'm just glad we didn't part with misunderstandings. Now we sometimes update each other on our lives. Maybe one day we'll be good friends. That's my hope as I move forward. My husband tells me not to sleep for more than three hours because I'm just his housewife, so I follow his rule, but. Sleep more than three hours, even by one minute, and it's divorce. One day, our protagonist, Emily, was shocked and horrified by her husband's sudden change. The man she thought was kind turned out to be utterly unreasonable. He was the worst kind of husband. She decided to get a divorce, but not before getting her revenge. Emily followed his ridiculous command to sleep only three hours and continue with the housework. When the divorce mediation ended, she felt liberated, thinking, I can finally sleep. But she was too excited to actually sleep. It was still early, and until she felt sleepy, she decided to share the story of her divorce drama on an online forum. Congrats on finishing the mediation! If you want to talk about it, we're here! What's with sleeping being the first thing on your mind after a divorce? Is divorce mediation really that stressful? No, divorce mediation wasn't that hectic. Well, it did get a bit messy, but living with my husband was seriously tough. He would say things like, since you're my wife, don't sleep more than three hours. As if I were some kind of robot or Napoleon. What do you mean? Are husbands confusing housewives with robots or something? I thought I wasn't interested in other people's divorce stories, but now I'm curious. What kind of husband was he? Initially dismissive of another divorce story, the forum's readers were intrigued by the episodes Emily shared about her husband. I was a former banker turned stay-at-home wife, and so was my husband. We actually met through work. It was an office romance at the same branch. Our relationship was officially approved by colleagues, and even our branch manager acted as our matchmaker at the wedding. It was all good until a problem arose. Our bank had a policy that couples couldn't work at the same branch. Seriously? That's a thing? Yeah, dealing with money and all, they're concerned about family ties creating issues, so they don't allow relatives to work together. So, parents and children, or any family members, can't work together in the same place. That meant if we got married, one of us would have to transfer to another branch. A transfer isn't based on personal preferences, 
It's like a roulette wheel of destiny. We could end up living apart shortly after getting married. That's when my husband said, Well, why don't you quit your job and be a stay-at-home wife? Honestly, I have some mixed feelings about being a stay-at-home wife. It's a tough decision to give up your job when you're getting married. But I knew we could manage with my husband's salary alone. And more importantly, I didn't want us to be separated right after getting married. So, I decided to become a stay-at-home wife. I was determined. But once I quit my job and became a stay-at-home wife, I found myself with too much free time. What? There's never enough time for housewives. Yeah, you never have too much time. Of course, I was doing various household chores, but we had only been married for a year, and we didn't have any kids. Our house was a new two-bedroom, and it wasn't that big. My husband took care of cleaning his own room, and the bathroom and toilet didn't get that dirty. I had a cleaning routine, deciding to clean different areas each day, which allowed me to even clean the windows every week. I had lived on my own for a long time before marriage, so I was quite good at housework and cooking. I knew all the shortcuts to make things easier. With all that free time, I found myself with nothing to do. Since we moved to the suburbs when we got married, I couldn't see my friends or family as often. Making new friends was difficult because the area was mostly farmland. It was a complete bedroom community so there wasn't much social interaction. Naturally, I started wanting some money for hobbies. And by the way, my hobby is singing karaoke on my own. Not having money for that was tough. Yes, I love singing karaoke on my own. But it was sad that there weren't any karaoke places nearby. Even though there were some a bit far away, the costs could add up. I really wanted some spending money for myself, so I talked to my husband about getting a part-time job. There was an opening at a nearby grocery store for a deli worker, and I thought it would be convenient and help me improve my cooking skills. Initially, my husband was hesitant, but I convinced him by promising to keep up with the housework and saying I wanted to cook better meals for him. At that time, we were the perfect picture of a newlywed, lovey-dovey couple and I genuinely wanted to expand my cooking repertoire for him. After persuading my husband, I started working part-time at the local grocery store. For the first few months, I enjoyed earning some money for my hobby and felt fulfilled. However, one day, after working overtime, I caught a glimpse of my husband's darker side. I remember it was the day before the graduation ceremony at the local middle school. We were busy preparing party trays, and I ended up working late. Usually, I'd be home in time to make dinner, but that day, I left the store later than usual because we were short-staffed. By the time I got home, my husband was already there. I brought home some extra party trays as an apology for being late and thought we could just have those for dinner. But suddenly, my husband yelled, I told you not to take that part-time job. How can you be a proper housewife if dinner isn't ready when I get home? I was completely taken aback. My husband had always been kind and gentle, never raising his voice at me before. I couldn't believe what was happening. He kept ranting and finally said, This better not happen again, or you'll have to quit that job. I apologized profusely and somehow managed to calm him down that night. The next day, I was nervous about what he might say, but surprisingly, he was back to his usual gentle self. He apologized, saying, I'm sorry I yelled. Work has been stressful and I just snapped when dinner wasn't ready. December is a busy time at the bank with various financial year-end tasks, and I remembered my husband getting emotional during busy periods when we worked together. So, I brushed off his behavior thinking it was just stress from work. But his outburst has shaken me, and since then, I found myself trying to avoid anything that might upset him. I should have recognized the red flags back then. Fearing his reaction, I became even more meticulous with work. 
One day, after a few weeks of this, I must have been exhausted. A coworker at the grocery store noticed and said, You look pale. Are you feeling okay? If you're not well, you should tell the boss and go home early. I did feel a bit off that day, so I took their advice and left early. So I got home around midday, feeling a bit tired, and decided to lie down on the couch for a short nap. No sooner had I closed my eyes than my husband woke me up with a shout. Hey, why are you sleeping? What? You're home already? What do you mean already? I got home at my usual time. I checked the clock, and sure enough, it was the time he usually got home. I must have been more exhausted than I thought and had fallen into a deep sleep. Naturally, I hadn't started dinner. I'm sorry, I was just really tired and fell asleep. Dinner's going to be late, so how about we order takeout? Are you kidding me? He shouted so loud that my ears rang. Being woken up like that made it even worse, and my head was pounding. Are you using your part-time job as an excuse to slack off on housework again? I told you, if this keeps happening, you'll have to quit. And what's this? A nap? While I'm out there working hard, you're sleeping comfortably? His ranting was all over the place. A housewife doesn't need more than three hours of sleep. From now on, you'll live on three hours of sleep. If you sleep more, we're getting a divorce. It was absurd. Even though I was groggy from being woken up, my mind snapped to attention. It was ridiculous. No one could function on three hours of sleep. But looking at my husband, it was clear he was dead serious. His face was red with anger, and he was breathing heavily. I suddenly felt very calm. I realized I couldn't continue living with this man. If I apologized and he forgave me, it would only happen again. He would keep yelling and controlling me. I could see my life becoming miserable, just obeying his every whim. If he wanted a divorce, fine. But I wouldn't just agree quietly. I decided to take my revenge thoroughly. So when he demanded I sleep no more than three hours, I agreed. He looked smug, thinking I couldn't manage it. But I was determined. From that day, I lived on three hours of sleep. I'd go to bed at 11 p.m. and wake up at 2 a.m. And the first thing I did was start cleaning the house. Yes, cleaning at 2 a.m. What else would a diligent housewife do? I'd open all the windows wide, even in the winter cold, and clean the windows. Then I'd vacuum, making sure to be thorough. With extra time on my hands, I'd scrub the hallway floors with a cloth, running back and forth until they shone. Even a short hallway deserves a spotless cleaning. As dawn approached, I'd move to the yard and start tidying up there. After that, it was laundry time. I'd gather all the dirty clothes and run the washing machine at full capacity, creating a lot of noise. When the laundry was done, I'd think about cooking, but by then my husband would wake up. What are you doing up at this hour? Oh, just housework. No, it's loud and cold and annoying. Stop it. But you said to wake up after three hours and not slack off on housework. <sighs> I didn't mean this. I said it calmly, and he had no retort, storming back to bed. So began my three-hour sleep regime. Of course, I couldn't survive on that alone. At work, I told my co-workers about my situation, and they were sympathetic, letting me nap during breaks or leave early to rest in the break room. After a few weeks of this, my husband was the one to break first. Enough. I need to sleep. Why don't you just sleep? I can't sleep with you up, making noise, opening windows, stomping around, and singing weird songs. 
Weird songs? That was insulting. I was practicing my karaoke. By the time I left for my part-time job, I'd usually finished all the housework for the day. With the extra time, I practiced singing softly so it wouldn't disturb the neighbors, but apparently, it bothered him. And so, we argued over my sleep schedule and the noise. In the end, my husband shouted, If you don't stop, we're getting a divorce. I couldn't take it anymore and yelled back at him. <sighs> Make up your mind. First you say you'll divorce me if I sleep, then if I don't sleep. Enough already. My voice was loud, thanks to all that vocal training for karaoke. Seeing him shrink back in fear was almost funny. My husband finally handed me the divorce papers he'd gotten from the county office, and it should have been a done deal. But he put up quite a fight. During our divorce mediation, he claimed, I've been deprived of sleep for weeks and suffered because of it. I want compensation. But he was the one who told me not to sleep. I argued this in court, but his demand for only three hours of sleep happened at home. And of course, I didn't have any recordings. My lawyer said that if the court believed I had been depriving my husband of sleep, it could be seen as abuse, and I might have to pay him compensation. But that was completely unfair. Thankfully, my colleagues at work, especially the woman who lived nearby, were a big help. My co-workers were aware of my situation because I often talked about how my husband only allowed me three hours of sleep. They saw how exhausted I was, sometimes looking like a zombie. One of them, who lived a few houses away from me, decided to check on me after I fainted at work from sleep deprivation. She saw me cleaning the yard early in the morning and even checked again at night, finding me cleaning the windows. Seeing this several times, she realized how serious the situation was and went to the police, who couldn't intervene in civil matters, so nothing happened. But her testimony was crucial in court. She testified that I was the one suffering, not my husband. My husband's claims backfired and the judge ordered him to pay me compensation and gave me a favorable property settlement. So that's how my divorce mediation finally concluded today. It took longer because my husband kept resisting. But it's finally over. After the trial, rumors spread at his workplace about how he lost the case miserably. And now, he's thinking of quitting. As long as he pays the compensation, I don't care. Everything said about him is true anyway. A former co-worker told me that after I started my Napoleon schedule, his work performance deteriorated, and he became a liability. Once the divorce trial started, it got even worse and his colleagues wanted him gone. <laughs> Serves him right. As for me, I moved back to my parents' house. Leaving my supportive co-workers was bittersweet, but they cheered me on, telling me to give my husband what he deserved. I never thought I'd make new friends after getting married, but I was touched by the connections I made. Now, I'm taking it easy at home. There aren't many karaoke places around, so I'm thinking of job hunting soon. I used to dread change, but now I feel optimistic about meeting new people wherever I go. Oh, I'm finally starting to feel sleepy. Thanks for listening, everyone. I'm going to get a good night's sleep. Not just three hours this time. And so, Emily drifts off, free from the control of a manipulative husband, finally able to sleep in peace. Do you have anyone in your life trying to control you like her husband? How do you handle it? Feel free to share in the comments. 
Thank you for watching. My husband, on a business trip, claimed he had a terminal illness and asked for divorce. I promptly moved out and informed his relatives. My husband decided to work away from home, and though I felt lonely, I firmly believed in the bond between us as a couple. However, as time passed and he returned home less frequently, my trust in him began to wane. When I confronted him to uncover the truth, he told unbelievable lies and avoided taking responsibility. I've resolved not to let him get away with such cowardly behavior. How will our conflict unfold? It turns out my husband was having an affair during his business trips. It was serious enough that I had to inform everyone. I often heard stories here about husbands cheating during business trips or wives cheating while visiting their parents after childbirth. But personally, I'm always alert to such things as I can't imagine cheating on someone. I thought it only applied to people who really put effort into their appearance. Or maybe those naturally blessed with considerable beauty. Because I couldn't imagine older men and women easily having affairs or rather romantic relationships. From my perspective, being married meant excluding oneself from being a romantic interest. Once I became a married person myself, I never looked at other men in that way. Well, maybe just a quick glance. So I was truly shocked to find out that my husband, Mark, had been cheating. I seriously doubted it, thinking, no way, no way. Was it just my overactive imagination? But this carelessness was no good. I was cheated on by my husband. It was shocking when I learned the truth, but his attempts to hide the affair were so pathetic. I quickly recovered from the shock, and then my love faded away like salt dissolving. Cheating, huh? Surprisingly, right? People can be like that, huh? Well, there are people like that. It's quick to recover from shock, huh? How lame was it? Tell me about it. All right, let me reflect on what happened to me. At that time, we were both 45 years old and had been married for 15 years. We had one child, a 13-year-old son. There was nothing particularly noteworthy about us. We were just an ordinary family. The only real concern at the time was that our son was going through a pronounced rebellious phase. Our once affectionate and adorable son suddenly became distant. Oh my, what should we do? This must be the rebellious phase. My husband and I would say to each other, puzzled. We were just an ordinary family. My husband was serious about his work and took good care of our family. However, the moment we started living separately, our ordinary days came crashing down. It was decided that my husband would transfer to a different location just as our son was about to start his second year of middle school. My husband initially felt lonely and suggested we all move together, but our son insisted he didn't want to transfer schools. I was worried about the financial impact of quitting my job. Also, I was concerned about the health of my mother-in-law and my father who lived nearby. After discussing how to handle all these issues, we decided my husband would move alone. We were told the assignment would be about three years. I thought we could manage that length of time. I was confident because we had been married for 15 years. My husband wasn't what you'd call a handsome middle-aged man, but just an ordinary guy with a bit of a belly. I worried about his lifestyle habits, but I never worried about him having an affair. Yet, he had an affair quite easily. It's strange, isn't it? We had a good relationship and a lovely child. Why would he want to have an affair? Was it because he was living alone? Was it because he was lonely living alone? Or was it simply a release of his desires? Either way, it's not acceptable. When my husband first started living alone, he called me every day, sent messages to our son on WhatsApp, and came home every weekend, staying until the last possible moment. But gradually, his attachment to me and our son started to fade. The phone calls decreased, and he sent fewer messages to our son on WhatsApp. His visits, which used to be on Saturday mornings, became Saturday afternoons, then evenings, and then Sunday mornings. Eventually, he stopped coming home on weekends altogether. At first, my husband's excuses were along the lines of, I have to work this weekend and was invited to play golf by a co-worker. But gradually, his excuses became more half-hearted. When I called on a night he claimed to be working overtime, he would say things like, 
I'm so tired from golf. It's so expensive too. So around this time, I started thinking something's not right with my husband. But at that time, I wasn't suspicious yet. I was just really worried about him. I wonder if he had mental problems at his new assignment. Looking back now, I was such a caring wife, right? I was genuinely worried about my husband. But even in my earnestness, I couldn't help but wonder: Are you really okay? Are you eating properly? You haven't caught a cold, have you? It's the weekend, but maybe I should come over there. I'll prepare lots of meals in advance for you. You should rest. If our son has no plans, I'll bring him along. As I spoke these gentle words over the phone, he suddenly seemed flustered, and then he said something like this:、uh, no, "No, it's better if you don't come over here. I didn't tell you because I didn't want you to worry, but I actually got a fever since this morning. When I went to the hospital, they said it's something contagious, so you shouldn't come here. I'm sorry, but I don't want to risk infecting you and our son." He hurriedly started acting like a sick person. He has seemed fine until then, but now he even started coughing. Yeah, it definitely seemed suspicious. I could feel that he didn't want me to come. The timing was suspicious, but maybe it's true. I understand the feeling of not wanting to inconvenience others with my own whims. Yeah, that's right. Maybe I'm being a bit suspicious too. But maybe he really does care about us. Caught in this dilemma, I ended up just thinking about my husband for now. But the next weekend, he claimed poor health again and didn't come home. He also refused when I suggested stopping by his place of assignment. Then the following week, he insisted he had to work on this day off. So I said, "I'll go to your place while you're at work. It's okay if you're not there. I'll cook and clean." But the night before, on Friday, he called and said, "Sorry, I'm not feeling well." It's a serious illness, so you can't come over here. Once again, he refused my visit over the phone. By this point, I wasn't just worried; I was suspicious. I became convinced that something was going on. It bothered me, so I decided to investigate. I really wanted to look into it myself, but due to the distance and lack of time, I hired a detective. Honestly, it was quite an expense, and I was taken aback. But true to their profession, they quickly and reliably gathered evidence. My husband was cheating on me; he was semi-cohabiting with someone. Whoops! I didn't realize the evidence was gathered so quickly. They really went all out with the affair, huh? Living together part time, huh? Is that why he refused visits? But seriously, an affair and part time cohabitation isn't that the worst? It really is the worst. That part. The part-time cohabitation. They're really immersed in their affair. And what really shook me was the identity of my husband's mistress. I had assumed he was cheating with some young girl because affairs usually involve younger women, right? But my husband's mistress is about the same age as me. Well, actually, she might even be older. That's the impression I got. What you might call an older woman. She wasn't like a glamorous beauty, just an ordinary middle-aged woman. Well, yeah. If I were to say she had quite a big chest, I wonder if she had a fuller chest compared to my flat chest. It's not like I felt defeated by that, but somehow it really irritated me. What really bothers me is what I feel insecure about. No, actually, she has what I wanted the most, and he's having an affair with someone like that. I couldn't help but think. I couldn't forgive him. I was burning with anger. I understand how you feel, but calm down. It'll be okay. Human worth isn't determined by chest size. I get it. It's natural to hate cheating yourself, but feeling like you lost to this person, especially, is unforgivable, right? I'm sorry for getting upset. No, the fact that my husband betrayed me and our son. Indeed, I was most angry about this matter, but somehow I felt even more frustrated. I thought, what am I going to do with this husband? Should I let him do as he pleases? Or boil him, or fry him. But while I was pondering these things, my husband took action first. One day, he called me with a heavy voice and made a ridiculous proposal. Hello, how are you? <coughs> oh, what's wrong with you? Another cold? Well, then I won't be able to come to your place this week either. That cold of yours—it's contagious, right? You're always falling ill every week. It must be tough. Yeah, that's right. I've been feeling unwell again. 
So I actually went to the hospital the other day. Hospital? You've been going there before, right? Oh no, this time I went for a detailed examination. The stomach issues have been persisting. Oh, I see. Is that so? Well, about that result. They said I only have six months left. There's nothing that can be done. Wait, what? You have only six months left? Yeah, that's right. So could you please divorce me? I don't want to burden you and our son with my illness. Divorce? But we're a family. Shouldn't we face illness together? I don't want to steal your time. That's why I've decided to quietly leave on my own. Please, grant me this final selfish request. Well, if you insist that much. Thank you, Sarah. Now about the division of assets in the divorce. Since I can't work anymore, could I get a bit more? Medical expenses are no joke. Also, I can't afford child support for our son. I have no savings or inheritance. Please, forgive me. So there won't be any division of assets or child support because you can't work? I guess that means you have no intention of paying alimony either. There won't be any alimony, right? It's inevitable when it comes to life. I see, but I'm a bit confused right now, so I'll organize my feelings and think things through after this. Oh, sorry for bringing this up suddenly. But let's proceed with the divorce for now. I'll send the divorce papers. Take care of our son. I hope he finds happiness. The above was the conversation exchanged between my husband and me. What do you think? Quite something, right? Did he lie about having six months to live to smoothly get a divorce? And then skipping out on alimony and child support? Are you serious? But there's a very low probability that it's true. Are you sure about that? Yeah, I'm fine. My husband is as healthy as can be. Actually, I recently received the results of my husband's health checkup, and he seems perfectly healthy. His triglyceride levels were a bit high, though. So the story about my husband having six months to live earlier was a blatant lie. I wonder why my husband thought he could get away with such a lie. Or maybe he thought he could deceive me like that. Do you think I'm being seriously underestimated here? It really got me furious. Besides, besides, isn't this just too cowardly? Isn't it too lame? Isn't it too pathetic? If you cheated and had a change of heart, then apologize clearly and show some sincerity. My anger was all over the place, and the last bit of love I had for my husband shattered into pieces. I thought, I'll be mean to him. I'll make him regret it. About a week after that phone call announcing his terminal illness, I called my husband in the middle of the day while he was at work. He didn't answer his smartphone, probably because he was busy, but I managed to talk to him by calling his office. What the hell, Sarah? Calling me at work? You called the office directly? Did you say something to my boss? He was looking at me weirdly. Well, you didn't answer your smartphone. By the way, are you still working, even though you only have six months to live? Oh, well, I have to hand over my duties. Even if I'm sick, it's irresponsible to quit so easily. I see. You're so dutiful. But it's okay. You can prioritize your health and quit right away. Oh? Huh? I explained to your boss earlier that you only have six months left to live, and that you're not in a state to work anymore. What? Why would you do that? Why would you do something like that without asking me? What? But it's true, isn't it? Or are you saying it's not? You can't work, so you can't pay for our son's child support, right? Oh, yes, but but work isn't that simple. What? It's unthinkable for a company to overwork a sick person. I'll report this to the labor union. No, calm down. Well, let's talk about this later. I have work to do now. Yes, right. The handover. Oh, and I also thanked your boss for that other thing. That other thing? Did you tell him something else? Oh, you know, the thing. About Ashley from your office taking care of you while you were away? What? How do you know about her? That's not important. Anyway, I told your boss that Ashley was living with you and taking care of you. I thanked him for that too. I said, your company is very caring. You told my boss that Ashley was coming to my house? Yes, because it's true, isn't it? I even have proof photos. Ugh. I'm really laying it on thick. I revealed everything to his boss so smoothly. His mistress was a woman named Ashley from the same workplace, revealing their relationship and punishing both at the same time. Nice. 
Yes, since his affair partner was someone from his workplace, I thought this would be an easy way to get revenge. The boss was really surprised. He was also surprised that my husband was practically living with Ashley. Because Ashley Ashley had a strong relationship with the boss too. By the way, the boss is divorced and single and Ashley is single too. They were even talking about promises of remarriage or whatnot. Well, setting aside the romantic chaos among these middle-aged men and women, my husband was left speechless by my report. But I didn't stop there. I dealt another blow. Also, I explained the situation to his parents so both his father and mother were surprised. You're no good. Keeping such an important thing a secret like this. Did you also tell my parents? Why would you do something like that on your own? But aren't we getting divorced? Naturally, we should inform each other's parents about the divorce. And then it leads to being asked about the reason for the divorce, right? I just answered honestly when I was asked. I didn't want to make my parents anxious. Don't do things on your own. But it's better to tell the truth. Well, if the reason for the divorce was something like infidelity, I understand the feeling of wanting to keep it a secret. But it's about life and death, so it can't be helped. Ugh. So your mom says she'll come to see you right away. She says she'd bring you home and take care of your recovery properly. I also arranged for relatives to be informed and to arrange for a car. It's really heartwarming that everyone is worried about you. They might be arriving there soon. They might even come to pick you up at your workplace. The call ended abruptly here. I was really frantic. Excuses to the bosses, excuses to my parents, and now excuses to relatives too? That's too many tasks. <laughs> He's telling strange lies to escape responsibility. And on top of that, telling such a heart-wrenching lie as having six months to live. Honestly, I couldn't forgive the affair itself, of course, but abandoning any attempt to make up for what he did. This cowardly way of doing things made me the most angry. Also, abandoning responsibility for our son. So while my husband was in disarray, I promptly submitted a divorce application. Furthermore, I decided to move to ensure we no longer had to live together. Actually, I did hesitate about moving, because I thought it was selfish of me to separate my son from his friends during his high school years. But my son, he encouraged me. I'll be fine. I can stay connected with my friends on social media, and I'll make new friends at the new school, he said. And he followed me saying that. Even though lately my son seemed annoyed with me, he said I don't have to rely on such a betraying father. I'll do my best. I'm okay with not going to high school and working instead, he said. I ended up crying. <laughs> but, but, I want to give my promising son as many choices as possible. So I will work even harder than before to support the path my son likes. Of course, I've properly demanded child support from that betrayer. My son is such a good kid. Even though he's in his rebellious phase and acts tough, there's love in his heart. I momentarily forgot about my husband due to my son's good story. What happened? Did he show accountability and explain? Well, after our call ended, my husband was first summoned by his boss to explain what happened, I heard. Was his diagnosis real? And what kind of relationship does he have with Ashley? So at this point, my husband confessed that the diagnosis was a lie and apologized. But it seems he denied having any relationship with Ashley. He brushed it off as a misunderstanding on my part. But I saw through it all along, so I sent a registered letter to my husband's workplace. It arrived the next day. In the end, my husband was called in again by his boss, questioned thoroughly, and it seems the truth about the affair was exposed. As a result of the workplace affair, both my husband and Ashley faced consequences. They were transferred to separate locations. So it caused quite a stir among his colleagues. And so his former colleagues naturally began to question this transfer. After all, he was transferred with a plan for three years, but returned within just one year. Moreover, there wasn't any particular promotion involved either. So his colleagues started investigating the reason for his transfer. Apparently he had an affair, lied about having six months to live, and tried to evade divorce alimony and child support. This was quickly found out. Now, my husband is like a sitting duck at work. And as for my in-laws and relatives who rushed over out of concern for him, their deep affection for him made his actions and lies unforgivable, and he was immediately disowned by both his parents and relatives. His parents were particularly furious and sad. 
Don't even show up at family events. We won't leave you any inheritance either. That's what they told him. My husband begged for forgiveness on his knees, but it seems he was unforgiven. In the end, my husband returned from his new assignment and ended up living alone in the house where our family of three used to live together. I'm lonely, so please come back. I cheated because I felt lonely. As long as you, Sarah, and our son are by my side, I'll be fine. Let's continue to live happily as a family of three. Abandoned by his parents and relatives, and now looked at with suspicion at work, my husband must have thought it was his last hope when he reached out to me and our son. However, I refused, of course. Even our son said, You're no longer my father. I now only consider my mother as my family. With these words, we decisively cut ties with my husband. Even though he's my son's biological father, I ended up making a painful decision. And so my heart ached just a little. Oh, by the way, it turned out my husband's six-month life expectancy was a lie, so I demanded alimony from him. I also received proper division of assets, and, of course, he agreed to pay child support for our son. I also received compensation safely from Ashley. You see, Ashley actually had quite a bit of debt and was planning to have my husband pay it off. In other words, she was plotting marriage fraud. She was deeply involved with the boss for the same reason. I thought... Ashley, what a wicked woman. I heard there were other employees who fell into Ashley's clutches. She's truly cunning, isn't she? I wonder how many people she deceived with those charms. So my husband was having an affair with such a woman. Because she demanded money, is that why my husband told such a lie? I guess my husband was also deceived, but it's pathetic that he was easily fooled by her allure. Yeah, why didn't Mark cheat on me? Was it love? I was curious about that, but I realized that being deceived can lead to cheating. But that doesn't mean I can sympathize with him. After all, my husband betrayed me and our son and even tried to deceive us. I'll never sympathize or forgive him. From now on, I'll live for my son's sake. I'll do my best not to let my son become like that scumbag. <laughs> I feel relieved after talking about it. I could reaffirm how much of a scumbag my husband is and I feel my decision was right. Thank you all for listening to my story. After cheating during his business trip and then telling the despicable lie of having six months to live, my husband abandoned all responsibilities as both a husband and a father. However, I could never forgive a husband who would resort to such cowardly tactics. That's why lying results in losing both trust and purpose. It's clear that nothing will remain afterward, and that's what I made sure to convey firmly to my husband. Next to me is my kind-hearted son. I truly wish for the two of us to be happy. It is impossible to be happy and to make people happy with a life obtained by lying. Because that happiness is just a lie. No matter how you struggle, it's an unattainable illusion. <laughs>